Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So Valentine's Day this year falls on a Sunday, and I thought that was the perfect opportunity to share a delicious brunch idea themed for the occasion. This menu is easy and delicious and filled with some of my most favorite comfort foods. And as always, at the end of the episode, I'm gonna give you my game plan for tackling the prep, and I'm also gonna share some decor ideas at the end if you're looking for some inspiration for how to set your table. So first up, we're gonna make these delicious strawberry almond scones that are light and flaky and so delicious. So the first thing you wanna do is add two cups of all-purpose flour to a bowl, and then you can also add a quarter cup of sugar. And then to that, you're also gonna add two teaspoons of baking powder and a half a teaspoon of salt. Then we're gonna add 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter that's been diced and is very cold. So making sure that your butter is chilled is really the secret, I think, to a light and fluffy scone. So the idea really is just to take the butter and mush it in between your hands, just like this, so that the flour has a way to incorporate with the butter. You don't wanna actually make scones in the food processor because what ends up happening is they get processed too much because when the butter melts in the oven, that's what creates the air pockets that then creates the flakiness of the scone. So sometimes the old fashioned method is the best method. You'll know that it's ready when it looks like a coarse meal. Then at this stage, we wanna add one cup of diced strawberries. Now, if you can't find fresh strawberries, you could use frozen. I just would not thaw them out. I would use them frozen. That way they won't get too watery or mushy on you. Then I have a half a cup of heavy cream in my pitcher. To that, I'm gonna add one egg. And this is gonna really help keep the scones together. If you've ever had a scone that's too dry and crumbly, chances are it doesn't have the egg in it. And then you can just whisk this up. Then we're also gonna add two teaspoons of almond extract, in it goes. If for some reason you're not an almond flavored person, <laughs> I know they're out there, you could use vanilla instead. I just think the combination of almond and strawberry is really delicious. And then we're gonna whisk this up. Then at this point, we're gonna just make a little bit of a hole or a divot in the center, and then we are gonna pour our cream mixture inside the well. And then you can just gently mix up the scone dough, making sure that the cream is incorporating and the flour is combining, and you just wanna do it gently. You don't wanna over mix. Otherwise, you'll end up with a tough scone. Now, another thing I should just mention, when you're pouring in the cream and you have like just a little bit left at the end of the container, don't wash that out because we're gonna use this to brush our scones after they're cut. And then you can go ahead and put some flour down on your board and then turn out your dough. I like to also get my hands kind of floured <laughs> before I go in. There. And then you don't wanna overwork this dough. So what I usually do is just kind of spin it around like this first to make sure that the flour is getting all over your little dough ball, see? And then all you really need to do is just press it down. There. Okay, and we're looking for a square. And just make sure that your rolling pin is floured slightly, and then you can just roll over your scones a little bit. Make sure your knife is floured, and you can use that to kind of square up the edges here and create a really nice tight square because this is what is going to give us the nice tidy corners on our triangles. There we go. You can get really obsessive at this part. I can remember when I used to have a crew shooting these videos and I would sit here obsessing over these corners and I could just see they were all like, oh my gosh, come on now, which is dangerous now that I'm here by myself because I could be doing this all day long. So I'm just gonna forge ahead, there we go. <laughs> Nobody likes perfect. Okay, there. So then we are going to cut it in half and then cut it in quarters. And if the strawberries start to peek out, that's okay. You stick them back in. There we go. And you can cut them in half and this is how you're gonna create your triangles. Then we are just going to gently transfer these to a baking sheet that's been lined with parchment paper. Now we're gonna go back to our pitcher that still has that little bit of cream at the bottom. That is the perfect amount to use to brush our scones with. And this will give them a little bit of a shine and will also prevent them from splitting apart. Now, you could make these scones the day before and have this all ready to go, pop this in your refrigerator, and then wake up the next morning and all you have to do is bake. I'll get into more detail in the game plan at the end of the episode, but if you're thinking ahead, not to worry, you can totally do it the day before. Then you wanna bake your scones at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for just 25 minutes. They'll be nice and puffed up and golden brown, and that's when you know they're done. 
Okay, so now for our juice blend. I wanted to show you how to do something that's super simple, but so delicious and so pretty too for Valentine's Day. In this carafe, I have four cups of just regular store-bought orange juice. To that, I am gonna add some of these beautiful blood oranges. We usually get these early because our spring really kind of starts in February, but you can see they are like so beautiful. And I can always tell when it's early in the season because they're kind of pink. As the season wears on and you get into like March, April, May, they start to become really deep and purple. Look at this, it is like the most beautiful pink juice but it also has the most fragrant flavor to it so great if you've never tried a blood orange okay this looks good so it took me about five blood oranges so if you're at the market and you want to know how many to buy I would say five or six okay then we are just gonna go ahead and pour it in look how pretty well, there we go you can serve your scones with some coffee, the juice, and if you wanna be extra festive for Valentine's Day, you can serve some hibiscus blend tea because it is the most beautiful shade of deep pink. Every time I think of Valentine's Day, I can't help but think of a souffle. I mean, is there anything more romantic, decadent, and delicious? <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you how to serve one for breakfast. It is so light, it is so delicious, and so beautiful. Whoever you serve this to is going to be completely blown away. Okay, so a cheese souffle typically has three components. We have the bechamel sauce, we have our egg yolks, and then the egg whites. So it's these three things that come together to form this delicious concoction. So let's start with the bechamel sauce, and this you're gonna make a day ahead. So in our skillet here, I have four tablespoons of just unsalted butter. And once your butter is melted and nice and foamy, then we're gonna add the flour. So I have a quarter cup of just regular all-purpose flour. And then you wanna whisk this up until a nice paste forms and then cook it for about a minute. And then to the paste, you're going to slowly add two and a quarter cups of just regular whole milk. You could also use 2% if that's all you had. So we're basically looking for this to simmer and start to thicken. But meanwhile, we can season it with three quarters teaspoon of salt, a little bit of freshly cracked pepper, and then one garlic clove that has been minced. So. You just wanna simmer the bechamel sauce until it coats the back of a wooden spoon. So something like this. That's all you need to do. Okay, so here comes the really delicious part, the cheese. So I'm gonna be adding a full tub of crumbled goat cheese. I go with the crumble just because it's easier to melt and then you don't have to chop it up or crumble it yourself. I know that there are people that don't like goat cheese, but I'm here to tell you that this souffle is not gonna actually taste like goat cheese. It's the weirdest thing. Once it bakes into the souffle, it just has a slight tang to it. So if you're not like so sure about the goat cheese, trust me on this one. You won't even notice it's in there. But if you really can't get on board with the goat cheese, then I would use Swiss cheese. I would do a cup, maybe a cup and a quarter of just grated Swiss cheese. You could also use Monterey Jack. So just keep stirring this up until all of your goat cheese has melted, which I think we are about there. Okay, then we can set this aside to cool and now I'm going to show you how to prep the eggs. So I have 10 eggs here and we are gonna separate them into yolks and whites. So I'm putting the yolks in a large bowl because this is the bowl we're ultimately going to then fold the egg whites into. So you want a larger bowl that can hold that volume. And I like to just keep it in the bowl that I'm gonna mix it in the next day. That way I'm a step ahead. So two tips when it comes to separating eggs. One, make sure your egg is very cold because a colder egg will be a lot easier to separate than a warm egg. If you try to separate a warm egg, the yolk is not very firm and it can start to separate in with the whites. And another thing that will help is to crack your egg on a flat surface, not on the bowl, because what will happen is the weakest point of an egg is in the center. I learned that from the domestic geek, she taught me that one. And that will give you two little equal cups to separate your egg in. Then we're also gonna add some fresh dill. That is such a great flavor combination, dill with the goat cheese and the egg. This actually would be a fantastic egg casserole for Easter or Mother's Day too. So if you like it for Valentine's Day, you could bring it back. <laughs> okay, so we are just going to whisk up our egg yolks here, and then we are going to add in our fresh dill. See how easy, it's all we have to do. And then we're gonna whisk that up. Our eggs look good, our egg whites are ready to go, so now what we can do is just cover them and pop them in the fridge, okay? I just recently discovered these cute little bowl covers. Aren't they the cutest things? <laughs> I just was like going nuts between all of the tin foil and plastic wrap that was in my life that I thought I'm just gonna invest in these. They're in my Amazon shop if you want a pair. Okay, so in the fridge they go. 
And now that our bechamel sauce has cooled, we can then transfer that into a bowl. Now I know it might be tempting to put this in with the egg yolks at this stage, just to save yourself a bowl. But if this bechamel sauce is even warm and it hits the egg yolks, it's gonna start to cook the egg yolks. So that's not gonna be good. <laughs> so it's better off to keep everything separate just until tomorrow when it comes time to actually put it together. Okay, so the morning of, here's what you're gonna do. Take all of your components and get them at room temperature. Just because they've been in the fridge overnight, all of these ingredients are pretty cold. So it's better off if they sit for about 30 minutes just to get them up to room temperature. It'll be better for your souffle that way. It'll rise quicker, it'll cook in the interior faster, and will prevent the top from getting too brown. If it's too cold inside, it's gonna take a long time to cook inside and the top could get too brown. So just set them on your counter for about 30 minutes which is okay because we can get started on our home fries, which is what we are going to serve with this delicious souffle. So while our ingredients are coming up to temperature, well, you can just peel these off. I'm working with three pounds of potato, which I think is good for six people. Okay, then to cut our potatoes, what you wanna do is cut them first in half, just like this, lengthwise, and then you wanna cut them with a nice chef's knife uh, in half, lengthwise. Just hold on to the top to make sure it doesn't come off. And the reason why you want to do this is this will help you get nice uniform cubes. The secret to a home fry, in my opinion, is making sure that all of the potato cubes are roughly the same size so that they'll cook at the same rate. And we only have 30 minutes that the souffle goes in the oven, so we want them to cook in that time. <laughs> all the more reason to be motivated. If you're looking at this and thinking, I don't have time for that. I totally get it. There were years when my kids were young, I didn't have time either. So what you could do is get some of those store-bought pre-shredded hash browns. That would be great. That would go well with this too. And just use the same seasoning that I'm gonna do and basically the same preparation and presto. No potatoes to peel, nothing to chop. But if you do have the time, I have to tell you, these potatoes are so good and delicious. There is a little bit of moisture to them, you'll notice, but leave them be because it will help them steam up when we cover them. And then we'll remove the cover to get them browned on the outside. So it actually works with you. And it's one less thing you have to do. <laughs> okay, then we are going to season these with a little bit of salt just to taste and pepper. Potatoes will soak up the salt. So I kind of give them a first dousing before I cook them, and then I'll also do it right before serving. So you can do that too if you want. And then I also do a good sprinkle, maybe a half a teaspoon of herbs de Provence. If you don't have that, you could use some dried oregano, dried basil. Okay, you can give them a toss. Just make sure all that seasoning is incorporated. We are gonna let these hang out just for 10 minutes or so. They're okay to do that while we get the souffle ready. And then we are going to cook these while the souffle bakes. And that's how I think this times out best. <laughs> okay, so now for our egg whites. We are gonna put them into a electric mixer. Then, to make sure that our egg whites become nice and fluffy and stabilized, they need a little bit of acid. So you could either use a quarter teaspoon of cream of tartar, or you could use a teaspoon of fresh lemon juice, which is what I'm gonna use. This is also going to prevent our souffle from deflating. If you have egg whites that are weak, this can happen. So to strengthen our egg whites, we're gonna make sure that they're nice and stiff, and we're gonna give them a little bit of lemon juice. Okay, then we're gonna go back to our egg yolks. We are going to combine our bechamel sauce with the egg yolks. Look how delicious this is. <laughs> this is not low calorie, I would say. And you just wanna get the egg yolks and the bechamel sauce all combined together. Then, to add our egg whites, we are just gonna add a little bit at a time and fold them in gently. So we don't wanna deflate all that gorgeous volume but at the same time, you do wanna make sure that it is combining with the egg yolk. So I typically just get under there and making sure that the yolk comes to the top and that the egg white is getting incorporated. And if you need to do like a little stirring just to make sure it's incorporating, that's okay, you're not gonna hurt it any. Then we're gonna pour this mixture into our nine by 12 casserole dish that has been sprayed with baking spray. And then you are going to bake at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 30 to 35 minutes. You'll see it'll start to rise up and crack. That's exactly what you want. Okay, so now for the home fries. It does help if you can get a nonstick skillet because the potatoes do get kind of sticky. Then you're gonna add three tablespoons of olive oil into the skillet, which might seem like a lot of oil, but we have quite a lot of potatoes here. And I find that if you want a really nice crunchy sear on the bottom, 
Three tablespoons is what it takes. You can pour in the potatoes. Then here's the other secret. You wanna make sure that you cover them because we're basically doing two things. We're letting them cook on the bottom so that they get nice and golden brown, but that we're also needing to steam them so that they get cooked through. And then just let them sit here for about five to seven minutes. Resist the urge to touch them and start poking at them because we really wanna get that nice caramelization on the bottom. You can shake them if you feel you need to do something. And then once they've been sitting here for a bit and you've been doing the shaking, then you can do an official flip just to make sure that you're getting browning on all sides. And then at this stage, you can just every maybe four or five minutes, just keep tossing them around until they're the color you like and they're cooked through. And then the other thing I like to do with the home fries is just add a little bit of freshly chopped parsley. Then about five minutes before your souffle is done, make sure everybody is at the table ready to go and bring it directly oven to table. It's funny, it's not like a regular souffle that will deflate really quickly. It will actually stay puffed up for quite a while, but it's just so much better when you can eat it hot from the oven with all of its volume. And when served with the home fries, it is the perfect comfort food brunch that everybody will just go nuts for. Okay, now for something sweet. I'm gonna show you two ideas that I think would be a fantastic way to round out this meal. You can make one or the other, or you could even make both. I'm gonna show you how to make a brulee grapefruit, which is a really simple idea, but is like the most delicious thing. So we're gonna be starting with some pink grapefruit. Then you are going to cut them in half. And then another thing you wanna do just to stabilize them is cut off just the tiniest sliver on the bottom of the peel, see like that and that will keep it from kind of rolling around. It'll stabilize it. And then take a sharp knife and just go all the way around the perimeter of the grapefruit. Um, but we're not gonna actually stop here. We're gonna do one more thing, and that is to cut in between the membranes um, to release the grapefruit segments. And that will loosen the grapefruit and make it a lot easier to eat. Then once you do that, you're gonna take a teaspoon of brown sugar and sprinkle it all over the top of the grapefruit. Then we are gonna place our grapefruit under the broiler for just about four to five minutes, just until that brown sugar is nice and bubbling and it will begin to brown in places. Then you can pull them out. And then the final thing I like to do to them, I love to add a little bit of freshly minced rosemary to the top of them. <laughs> I know that might sound like a really strange combination, but it's so good. It's refreshing and sweet all at the same time. And then that little touch of rosemary on the top. It's just so yummy. Okay, now for the decadent part, some homemade hot chocolate. Now you might just be thinking of hot chocolate for Christmas, but I actually think it's a great little dessert idea for Valentine's Day. So I'm gonna make it in a Dutch oven. That way I can just reheat it the next day. So we are gonna add eight cups of whole milk. And to that we're gonna add a half a cup of unsweetened cocoa powder, a half a cup of powdered sugar. And then you wanna put this on a medium high flame and then whisk it up. And as you whisk it together, it will start to dissolve and melt and come together. Now, because we're serving this as a dessert, it's really up to you how chocolatey you wanna make it. So you may also wanna add some of this bittersweet chocolate. I like to have the combination of the unsweetened cocoa powder and the bittersweet chocolate, just so one, it's not too sweet. That way you can really control the sugar. Um, and also, I think they sort of impart different flavors. Okay, so I've got my hot chocolate all filled up in my mug here. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of this homemade whipped cream. And then it wouldn't be Valentine's Day without some heart sprinkles. So I'm gonna put a few of these on top. I like the combination of the pink and the red, but if you were partial to one color, you certainly could pick them out. It's the perfect little festive treat to end your Valentine's Day brunch. Okay, if you'd like to make my Valentine's Day brunch, here's your game plan. So the day before, you can make your scone dough, cut the scones, brush them with the cream mixture, then loosely cover with foil and pop in the fridge. You can squeeze the blood oranges, combine them with the store-bought orange juice and store that in the fridge. You can make the bechamel sauce for the egg souffle. Separate the eggs, whisk the egg yolks with the dill, cover and refrigerate. You can whisk up all the ingredients for your hot chocolate, put it in a Dutch oven so it's easy to reheat and then pop it in the fridge. You can also make the homemade whipped cream, transfer it to a pastry bag fitted with a tip and pop that in the fridge. The morning of, you can prep your grapefruit. So go ahead and slice them, cut around the perimeter, and separate the membranes, and then pop those in the fridge. I would just wait to add the brown sugar until you're just about to bake. That way it won't soak too deeply into the grapefruit and prevent it from caramelizing on top. 
Then you can go ahead and bake off your scones, allow them to cool slightly, place them on a platter and bring them to the table along with your juice. And then remember to start the coffee or the tea. Then take out all the components for the souffle and allow them to come to room temperature. Meanwhile, you can peel your potatoes, cut them into cubes, and season. Then remember to set your oven for 350 degrees for your souffle. So that way, as soon as it's assembled and in your casserole, you can put it straight in the oven. Now you can get the home fries going, making sure that they're getting golden brown, but also tender inside. Then five minutes before the souffle is ready, call everybody to the table, add your chopped parsley to the home fries and transfer them to a bowl, and then serve your souffle as soon as it is ready. Then when everybody's clearing the plates, you can reheat the hot chocolate, Put your brown sugar on your grapefruits, pop them under the broiler. Make sure you set your timer for four minutes because you don't want to forget about that grapefruit. Then place your grapefruits on a platter, add the rosemary, bring those to the table, then pipe your whipped cream on top of the hot chocolate and garnish with your sprinkles. So one thing that I have learned about entertaining over the years is, yes, it's the recipes, yes, it's the planning, but the third thing that sometimes becomes overlooked is the environment. There's something about setting a beautiful table that just puts everybody in the right mood and somehow just nurtures the soul. So if you need some inspiration, here's some table decor ideas that would go great with this menu. So for a color palette, I always think it works best to pick two dominant colors and then two to three supporting colors. This will get you the most cohesive and interesting look. So for my dominant colors, I went with a dusty pink and cream with supporting colors in a soft gray, touches of gold, and natural wood. And when using a simple color palette that's monochromatic, I think it also really helps to tie in texture. And it just makes what could be a simple color scheme a lot more interesting. So for the table runner, I went with a natural cream, but it's made out of rag work, which makes it a lot more interesting and gives it a cozy, wintry vibe. Then to give the runner more interest, I love to use a selection of bud vases of different shapes, different sizes and styles. Even though they came in a set, it looks like I've been collecting each vase over a course of many years. Just gives them more interest. And I think bud vases like this look best with just a few blooms in them. And normally I am a proponent of fresh flowers, but for something like this, I wanted to do something a little bit more fun that almost felt more like decorations. So I went with these fabulous fakes. They're poppies that from a distance look really real. And it's kind of fun because you can use them year after year. Now the plates are another way that you can add more interesting texture into the scheme. I went with these gray plates. I love the soft color. It almost looks like it's been hand thrown. Now I usually will go with a neutral color for the plates just so the food will pop, but the napkins are a great way to add in your color scheme. I think there's something really lovely about a French linen napkin that has a little bit of a wrinkle to it. But I find the best way to fold these napkins is to iron them flat and then don't iron in the crease so that you have one flat napkin. Then naturally fold them into the shape you want and you'll find you get the softest, most natural fold that way. I usually see cutlery as like the jewelry of the table. It's a small accessory that can add a little punch of one of your supporting colors or textures. And then I also brought in another wood piece in the form of a trivet. It's made out of oak and I love it because it's adjustable. So depending on however big your casserole is, it can adjust to its size. And then for the juice glasses, look for something that's etched or has a bubble in it. They look like they're hand blown and it just sort of continues that artisan theme. Now everything that I've shown you so far are pieces from my collection that I mix and match for all types of occasions. And I think that's really good advice if you're just starting to build your tabletop wardrobe is pick things that you can use more than once. But I usually reserve one thing on the table that is specific to the holiday. And for me, I love these little love mugs. I think there's something so cute about the little pop of color of red, the stitching on the top, and of course the little heart inside the mug. How cute is that? And then lastly, for a little whimsy, I love these woven trivets. In fact, this is how my whole color scheme began. <laughs> I saw these trivets in these beautiful colors and I thought that is a Valentine's Day scheme. So sometimes inspiration for your tablescape can come from any one piece you may have in your collection and then you can build off that. Okay, you guys, thanks for sticking with me. What a fun way to spend a Saturday. I hope you enjoyed this. Okay, you've got the menu, you've got the game plan, you've even got the table setting. You have everything you need, and I wanna hear all about it. So leave me a comment, share your photos with me on social media, and let's toast to love and everything it brings. Okay, you guys, I'll see you back here next time. Until then, bye.